Good morning everyone. Sorry for the confusion this morning. Uh, I didn't think I was supposed to be up here. Somebody else is supposed to be up here so you'll have to bear with me while I gather a few thoughts. We're starting a new quarterly in the crucibles of Christ. Better start out with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for the many blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for this place that we have to come together and worship you. Lord, we pray that your spirit will be with us. Lead us and guide us in this study, and may you be glorified. Thank you for each and every one of, them, one of us that are here. We pray that you will open up our minds and our hearts, that we may become closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Crucified Creator. Like I said, we're starting a new quarterly. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing was not anything made that was made. John one three. All things were made by him. Who are we talking about? Jesus Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. So without Christ, what are we? We are nothing without Christ. All things were made by Him, Jesus, and yet according to Scripture, Jesus wept. John 11:35. The Creator wept. Even more so, Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53:3. The Creator, a man of sorrows, despised and rejected. And he once cried out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. Why did the Lord scream that out? He stood between us and God, didn't he? And he took our sins and he bore them on the cross. How could these things be? Because Jesus, our Creator, also our Redeemer, and as such, He was the crucified God, the Creator who took humanity, and in that humanity suffered through the life of privation, toil, that ended with Him hung on a Roman cross. He bore the sins of the world, each, each one of our sins. The cross is a revelation of our dull senses of pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. So what does sin do? It causes pain, suffering. Do we see that in our lives today? How so? By sickness and disease? Yeah. Hardship. Selfishness. Thus our Creator, the one in whom we, we live and move and have our being, Acts 17.28, suffered in humanity in ways that none of us ever could. We can experience only our own griefs, our own sorrows, at the cross he bore. At the cross he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53, 4, all of them. In the most amazing act in the cosmic history. We can only experience our own griefs. But Christ experienced all of them for all of us. 
it's an amazing story when you think about it. With that background, that of the crucified God lifted up before us, we will, for the next few months, seek to better comprehend the incomprehensible, our own suffering. The sufferings of Christ, of those who have committed their lives to Christ, we make no claims to have all the answers, or even many. We're claiming only that God is love, 1 John 4, 8, and that although these things happen, we can trust God despite them, and indeed, grow in grace through them no matter how painful the process. God is love. This quarter we will study the Word of God and see how our flesh and blood, through, though radiant in faith, nevertheless face despair, betrayal, disappointment, loss, injustice, and abuse. Is that anything that you can relate to? Have you ever suffered loss? How about disappointment? Is there anything that we have suffered that our God has not? He bore our sins and our guilt, didn't he? And he was tempted in all points as we are. What do we learn? What can their examples teach us? As we look at these people, their experiences, their struggles and their trials of faith, which might be much like our own, we must always see the contrast against the background of the cross. We must always remember that no matter what anyone faces, Jesus Christ, our Creator and our Redeemer, went through the worst. He suffered worse than any of us. Our God is a suffering God, even albeit came as hardly a Christian understood some of the implications of the cross and the sufferings of God there. The night on Gil Golgotha is so important in our history of man only because it's a shadow. The divinely abandoned its traditional privileges and drank the last, to the last drop despair included agony and death. The cross is a revelation of our dull sense of the pain that from very inception sin has brought on the earth. Let's look at our lesson. The Shepherd's Crucible. Our memory text is, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He restores my soul. He leads me into paths of righteousness for His name's sake. How does the Lord restore our soul? He's our creator, isn't he? He has our soul in his hand. And only if we trust in him. First Corinthians 3, 23. If ye are Christ, all things are yours. We see in the Mount of Blessings, uh, the Lord's Prayer. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. So we, we can't even be selfish in our own prayers, can we? As a personal Savior, he is not an orphan to bear the burden of his own sin. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, then we may be also glorified together. It doeth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2 and Romans 8, 16. The very first step in approaching God is to know and believe the love that he has to us. How do we do that? How do we know that God loves us? How do we know that He loves us? Look at nature. 
How about the ex experiences of our life as we look back upon our experiences? I look back on my life and I see that how the Lord has led me. And I can only understand as I look back. As I look forward, I don't see very much. I, you look forward in faith, but you look, you look bad at, back at experience, don't you? And it's a windy road. I know that my experience is a windy road to where I'm at today. How about you? Is your experience with God and His love? How is your experience? Right? We can't forget, can we? I, I'm the same way when I look back. There are things that happened in my lifetime that there's no way that I got it. It, it just happened and, and the Lord was gracious and He He led me somehow, some way. Every time I tried to lead myself, I got myself in trouble. For it is through the drawing of His love that we are led to come to Him. The perception of God's love works the reunification of selfishness. In calling God our Father, we recognize all His children as our brethren. We are all part of the great web of humanity, all members of one family. In, the, in our petitions, we are to include our neighbors as well as ourselves. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. Who is my brother? Everyone. We're all children of God, aren't we? At what times have you grown more spiritually? Through the easy times or the hard times? It always seems to be the hard times, doesn't it? Why is that? Okay, the hard times drive us to God. Why is that? We need help then, don't we? We need help then, don't we? When things are good, do we need help? Yes. We do? We're rich and in need of nothing, right? When I'm rich, do I feel like I have trouble? Woe to the rich, right? Brings in all kinds of different things, different problems. Then you got to worry about somebody taking it from you, right? If you don't have any, you don't have to worry about it, do you? Well, there haven't been too many times in my life when I had more than I needed. So why is it like that? We don't need any help when we're, when we're rich. So through the easy times or the hard times, when we truly become a Christian and we truly find the Lord, we, He will be first in our lives no matter what. I think of some of the characters in the Bible. We just studied Joseph and how he was always lifted the Lord up. And I think of Daniel and his situation. He prayed three times a day, no matter what. He never let for fame and fortune go to his head. I was reading a story of Ellen White and she was worried about when she got her visions that she would become proud and she prayed that the Lord would not allow her to be proud. That she wouldn't be lifted up by her own, own self. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. The infinite God, said Jesus, makes it your privilege to approach Him by the name of the Father. Understand all that that implies. No earthly parent ever pleaded so earnestly for an erring child as he who pleads with a transgressor. 
No human loving interest ever followed the impenitent with such tender invitations. God dwells in every abode. He hears every word that is spoken, listens to every prayer that is offered, tastes the sorrows and disappointments of every soul, regards the treatment that is given to father, mother, sister, friend, and neighbor. He cares for our necessities, and his love and mercy and grace are continually flowing to satisfy our needs. We, li we serve an amazing God, do we not? Sunday's lesson, a guide for the journey, the, sh the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What makes the Lord our shepherd that we shall not want? He's our leader. It's where our guidance comes from. Okay. It says, I shall not want. If we have Christ in our life, what else do we need? He will give us everything we need, won't he? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Some children were asked to draw a picture of God. Without exception, each one drew a picture of, with a heart somewhere in it. When asked why, they declared unanimously that God is love. It was as simple as that. God is love. Is there anything that we have brought into this world? Is there anything that we're going to be able to take with us? Our character is the only thing. And it needs to reflect what? Christ's character. That's the only character that he will recognize. The only character he will recognize. His own. We need to be a reflection. Just like the moon reflects the sun. We are to reflect Christ. How do we do that? How do we reflect the character of Christ? How do we build that character? How do we become like our Creator? Our experiences? Pray? We have to get rid of our selfishness. We let Christ lead us. Go ahead. Okay, we have to ask him. We have to wrestle with him, don't we? Like Jacob. We have to come out of the world, don't we? We have to stick to the scriptures. We have to make them our daily study and become a part of us. The scriptures are our protection and our guide. It is easy to have a good opinion of God and His purposes when everything is going well. But as we grow older and life becomes harder and more complicated, our view of God often changes. God doesn't change, of course. Let's look at Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied by them. So Christ is the same yesterday and today. Let's look at James 1.17. Let's start at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, 
that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Sometimes we associate bad things that happen to us with acts of God. But this is completely different. It tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift. Do you have that experience in your life that you can look back on? I think each one of us, if we're honest with ourselves and we look back and we can say that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Certainly, we have a loving creator. Any other experiences? I, wasn't, I didn't grow up in the church either. So, I was struggling. And one day, I just knelt in my living room. I didn't go to church. My dad was a non-practicing Catholic, and my mom was a Methodist, I think. But we really didn't ever go to church. and um, So I really didn't know how to do anything or what to do anything. But I knew that there was a God, and I knew that there was something out there that was nudging and pulling me. And I knelt with, in my living room, and I asked God to show me the truth. And it's been a long, windy road, but I believe that the Lord has fulfilled that and answered that prayer in my life. He showed me the truth. He's led me to be standing here in front of you today. And believe me, that's an amazing feat when you think of all the experience in life and all of the things that can happen to you and all the things that do happen and you survive and you make it and you go through hard times and you go through good times and just the promises of the Lord and the experiences in the Bible. I believe. I'm a believer. Because I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for God's gift. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. What an awesome gift. What an awesome pledge that he has given to us. We did not choose to be alive, but He had His grace upon us and He gave it to us. What a perfect, what a good gift and what a perfect gift. Because of the pastoral lifestyle of the people in the Old Testament times, Psalms 23 uses the image of the shepherd to describe the way God cares for us. The symbol of the shepherd is used for God. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's a wonderful picture and one that has changed us too. Why is it a wonderful picture that we have a shepherd? I don't know too much about sheep or being a sheep herder, but I have learned a couple of things about sheep and I know that they are of the most, maybe the most timid animal that God has created. They have, they cannot take care of themselves at all. Is that right? The symbol, the symbol of the shepherd is used for God. It is both in Old Testament and, New, and in the New Testament. It is a wonderful picture. That one is changeless too. What do we learn about the shepherd from the text? Isaiah 40 verse 11. He leads and carries us. He will gather us the lambs in his arms. How about Jeremiah 23, 3 and 4? He feeds us and he will gather his remnant, right? How about Ezekiel 34, 12? What do we, what do we read in Ezekiel 34.12 
seek out my own sheep. Why is that important to us if we're all sheep? That the shepherd seeks us out. A sheep can't find its way, can it? And if we're like sheep, we can't find our way without our shepherd. How about John 10, 14 and 16? I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they will hear my voice, and they will be one flock and one shepherd. The Lord's sheep will hear his voice, and there will be one. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. How about 1 Peter 2:25? For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The shepherd and overseer of your souls. Turn to Psalm 23. What does the shepherd do to care for his sheep? Look in Psalm 23. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Maybe we just read the whole Psalms and then we can go through it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. What a precious promise. So in Psalm 23.2, what do we read? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That seems like a, the right place to be, doesn't it? Rest in the waters of his righteousness. Psalms 23.3, He restores my soul. He restores my soul and leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Not for anything that we do, but it's for Him. Psalm 23.4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yesterday we had quite a storm in Box Elder. I don't know if you guys, any anybody experienced that here in town, but we had one whale of a storm, and I have never seen it like that before. We had pea-sized hail, and I, I don't know how hard the wind was blowing, but you couldn't see across the street, and it would just come in waves. And it would just pepper in the windows in the house and it would just roar. And it probably lasted, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes. It would, it would roar up really hard and then it would kind of back off just a little bit. You'd think, well, maybe it's over. You know, usually when it hails, it only hails for a few minutes and then it's over. But this was a long time and the, and the rain and the came down. It was awesome. I mean, it was awesome. I don't think I've ever experienced that in my life. (laughs) 
That doesn't surprise me. There was water running in the, the ditches were completely full and and after you know, after it's over the sun comes out and it's nice and calm and there's not even a breeze. And we went into town and rapid. It didn't even look like you guys hardly got any rain here at all. Michelle's flowers on the front porch were just sandblasted. I mean, they were they were just stubs. They had she had beautiful flowers in a pot out front, and they were just nothing but stubs about this tall. Our garden looks about the same. Yeah, I was <laughs> when when you think about yeah, so I walk through this valley of the shadow of death. You know. We were concerned because, you know, because of the possible damage or whatever. But the hail wasn't very big, but it was, there was a lot of it. I mean, it piled up. It looked like a snowbank in front of my garage, in front of the door. It was, it was probably that wide. You could barely step across it to get out onto the porch where it just pushed up against the house. It was... It was awesome. We're going to see some amazing things as, as the Lord withdraws His hand from this world. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Do we have anything to fear? If the Lord is our guide, we have nothing to fear, do we? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalms 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. And six. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a precious promise that we all need to claim. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does it mean to you that there is someone like this who cares for you? What does it mean to you? Does it matter? You know the little things that upset us? cause us to have differences. When we think about the big picture, they don't really matter, do they? The Lord's going to take care of it all. How can we use this in our life to help others to understand what a great gift that we have? We have to live it and, and believe it in ourselves, don't we? It has to become a part of us. And that's part of the study that we talked about. We need to have our we need to have our Bible study, our personal time with God, and we need the word to speak to us and to live in us. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that what it's all about? Is that why we're here? Locations on the journey. He leads me in the right... Uh, on, on Monday. He leads me in the right path for His name's sake. Imagine the, the path of righteousness stretching out before you. Way out in the distance. You cannot see the end, but know that the end of the journey is home, God's house. And you focus a little closer to you. Do you see where the path leads? You can see some places clearly, but other parts are totally obstructed by the large and dangerous obstacles. Sometimes the path disappears over the ridge. Some parts of the path are easy to walk along. Others are difficult. It was just like this that the Israel traveled from Egypt to the Promised Land, and it is described in the same way in the Psalms. And I liken that to my 
Christian experience in my life, you know. Some things have happened and that you see and you know you're going the right direction and other times you just kind of get led into places that after it's over with, you know you, sure, you were supposed to be there. From Psalms 23, the location that David sees the sheep passing through when following the path of righteousness as they make their way to the house of the Lord. Why are these paths called paths of righteousness? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. What's that? Christ builds our character to the different things that happen to us in our lifetime, in our trials. I um I used to work for a, a company and we had some equipment that was going to come in and I was the manager of the maintenance department and we all had we had it all planned out how it was going to work well the equipment got delayed and so it was going to be we're going to have to install it over the weekend and I didn't know what to do because of Sabbath. And I was going to have to be there. And I'd worked for the company for a while. And it was a, a hospital, Mercy Hospital in Springfield. And they were a Christian company. And when I went to work for them, I thought, oh, great, I'm working for a Christian company. Well, they were Catholic-based. And they didn't care too much about the Sabbath. And so I was really having a struggle because I knew my boss was not going to let me have it off. And so I fretted about it. I struggled with myself and I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I was just getting ready to say something to the manager. And one of the other guys on the shift that had been there for a long time, a leader, he came up to me and he goes, Hey, my wife's got some of this thing going on Sunday. He goes, I'll take Saturday if you'll take Sunday. You know? And I'm like, you know, the Lord is good. And and I just, I fretted for a whole week and tried to figure out how I was going to get out of it. And, you know, the Lord is good. Because I was wrestling that whole week and, and He was showing me that finally He is in charge and that He can take care of anything. And it worked out great. And I didn't have to have that, didn't have to do that. So those are some of the ways that the Lord has led me and lets you know that He's there and He's watching and He knows what's going on. He is in control. But why are these paths called paths of righteousness or right paths? Here are four important reasons. They are the right path because they lead to the right destination, the shepherd's home. Second, they are the right path because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Third, they are the right path because they train us to be the right people, like the shepherd. Fourth, they are the right path because they give us the right witness. As we become the right people, we give glory to the Lord. They are the right or righteous path, whether the going is easy or hard. So whether the path is easy or hard, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is important to realize that when God leads us, it is not simply a question of his delivering a parcel to the destination. It is more than guidance and protection. Like the many examples all through the Bible in which God is leading his people, whether he is leading Abraham, 
by his promises are leading Israel by the pillar of fire and cloud. When God is guiding, it is always about his training his people in righteousness. There's always a lesson for us in whatever the Lord is trying to accomplish in our lives. Whether it's something good or something bad, there's always a lesson in it for us. And all things turn out good for those who love the Lord. So we know that in the end, it's all going to be good for those of us who love the Lord. How conscious are you that the righteousness is the shepherd's priority in your life? How conscious are you that Christ is in your life leading and guiding? If we spend time on our knees with the Lord, and we spend time in His Word, we become close to Him. We can do all things through Christ. We can do nothing from ourselves. That's right. How can trials change your life so that you better reflect the character of Christ? We have trials that teach us a lesson. Okay? That's how we get taught. I, I think sometimes it's easier when it's, when it's difficult, isn't it? Sometimes that's the only way we can see the dross in our life, isn't it? It's when the Lord exposes through trial the things that are, we want to purge from our lives. Well, we all have been given a bad inheritance, okay? It's something that we have to overcome. Adam and Eve, Eve were created like their, like God, and we were created like them. So we have a bad inheritance that we have to overcome. And it's only by the grace of God that He keeps bringing us those trials. He's bringing them around until we finally understand, oh, we're like sheep. We don't really know which way we're going, you know. So we need the Lord to guide and direct us. I think we'll close with that. If anybody has anything else they'd like to contribute, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd. Lord, like sheep, we all are astray. We pray that you will herd us together and that you will show us your, your love. And we know that every good gift and every perfect gift is from you. Lord, we praise your glorious name and we thank you for the trials that you give us that help teach us your will and your way. Go with us the rest of this day. May you be glorified in our worship service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.